Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're going to be looking there in just a moment. We began last week considering the story of Joshua once again, as, as we've been thinking about this idea of pressing on this year, continually making the right choices even in difficult circumstances. And that's how you reach the mountaintops, and that's how you, you uh, can look back and see that you, uh, you succeeded in life. You know, a lot of times we only think of those highlights in people's lives, especially Bible characters. Those are the exciting stories, the ones we like to read and we like to hear over and over again. But we forget about all of the hard times, those valleys between the mountains. And in Joshua's case, we began looking last week at really, uh, not the first time, but really the, the main time that we think of uh, him as first taking the lead in something. Uh, when the twelve spies went into the land of Canaan, they came back and ten of them uh, gave an evil report. They said that the land was good, but the people were too strong. Only Joshua and Caleb stood against the crowd, and they stood with God. Because of that, God said everybody else is going to die in the wilderness from 20 years old and upward, except for Caleb and Joshua. They would make it into the promised land. We're fast-forwarding in the story a little bit here, uh, about 40 years, give or take. And we're going to be looking at something that happened at the end of Joshua's life when he was put in charge of the entire nation of Israel. But as I was preparing for this message and thinking about what to title it and, and how, to, uh, how to approach this, I, I thought about all of these people who call themselves self-help gurus. You know, the, the kind that they have their book and they guarantee that if you'll buy their book and, and read their book, then you are guaranteed success. Or if you take this program of theirs, you know, for three easy payments of $99.95, uh, you are guaranteed to succeed in business. Or you're guaranteed to succeed in, in uh, your fitness goals. Or you're guaranteed to succeed in your finances. And all of these uh, gurus that have these books and conferences and systems make the bold claim that if you follow their teaching... You are guaranteed success or your money back. Isn't it funny they put that or your money back on there? <laughs> if they were really so confident that their system was guaranteed to work, why would they have to offer you a refund if it didn't? There's always that little caveat there. Makes you think they're not maybe as sure of themselves as they claim to be if they aren't willing to leave it at guaranteed success. You know, the truth is, the only way to have guaranteed success is to follow God's Word and God's will. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That's the only way to guarantee success in life is to follow God's will and God's word. When you live your life by the Bible, God guarantees your success. Now, Joshua needed to hear that in Joshua 1 and verse number 8 because he had a pretty big task ahead of him. And it seemed kind of unlikely that he would succeed. He was in charge of probably more than 2 million Israelites and he was supposed to lead them into the promised land, to lead them in conquering the inhabitants of the promised land so that they could possess the land. There was a lot of challenges here. There was the challenge of the people themselves because they had a track record for, of not being exactly easy to get along with. There was the challenge of the inhabitants of the land because they just weren't going to step aside and say, sure, why don't you just come on in here and take all my stuff? It was going to be some fighting involved. There was some difficulty that he was going to have to overcome. He needed to hear these words from God. That if you want to be successful, Joshua, then don't let the book of the law depart out of your mouth. Meditate in it day and night and observe to do according to all that is written therein. And when you do that, you will be successful. Now, I believe that all of us would agree with that this morning. You would agree with me that if you follow God's Word and if you follow God's way, you will be successful in life. But at, what I would like to do this morning is to take a minute to break down the mechanics of that, if you will, and talk about why or how that guarantees your success. 
It's okay to acknowledge that as a concept, but let's think about how that works and why that works in our life. And I believe in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we find a verse of Scripture that is a key to understanding this principle and how it works in our lives. Now for context here, Deuteronomy chapter 31 is kind of like Joshua's inauguration. So in our American system of government, every four years we have a presidential election. And we elect somebody to lead our nation for another four years. And after a new president is elected, there is a ceremony called the inauguration that takes place in the month of January. And during that ceremony, this person is officially put in charge of the nation. This is what is happening in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Only there hadn't been a vote, and this wasn't an inauguration. This was actually God appointing Joshua as the next leader, and Moses, the current leader, is passing the baton, if you will. He's handing it off to Joshua, and he's, t he's telling all the people that Joshua is now going to be the one in charge of you. So with that understood, let's go to verse number 1, and we're going to read down through verse number 8. Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, He will go over before thee, and He will destroy the nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, He shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sion and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he hath destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, and he will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Over and over again, God told Joshua, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Don't be dismayed. And here we find at this inauguration of Joshua that this promise of God contained in verse number 8 is given not only to Joshua, but to the entire nation of Israel. And the Lord, He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. And in that verse... We have the explanation for why we are guaranteed success when we follow God's Word and when we do God's will. It is because we have the preparations of God, the presence of God, and the power of God all working together to guarantee our success. You can be assured that God will work on your behalf when you follow His will and obey His word. And that is what guarantees success. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law this morning. Help us to leave encouraged by the story of Joshua that we too can succeed in life if we will obey your word and follow your will. Lord, it's not because of what we do, but it's because of what you do on our behalf that our success is guaranteed. Lord, we, we want to acknowledge that so that you get all the glory for what is done in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In this verse, we have three specific promises regarding God's working in our life that guarantees our success when we follow His Word and His will. First of all, we have the promise of the preparation of God. Notice in verse number 8, Moses said to Joshua, And the Lord, 
He it is that doth go before thee. He it is that doth go before thee. What exactly did Moses mean when he said this to Joshua? Was he just saying, hey, God's going to go on ahead and He'll be waiting for you when you get there? No, he meant more than that. He meant that God would be going ahead to prepare, to get things ready for them, if you will. Look back at the verses uh, earlier, verse number 3 of this chapter. It says, "In the Lord thy God, He will go over before thee, and He will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess, possess them. So he's specifically talking about God going on beforehand and doing a work of preparation so that when Joshua and the Israelites got to the land, the land would be theirs for the taking. So it's not just a before the in sense of time, but it's before the in a sense of purpose. God's going to be there getting things ready. Now keep your finger in Deuteronomy 31 and turn over to Joshua chapter 2. And I want to show you some proof here that God had already fulfilled this promise. Joshua chapter 2, just a few pages over in your Bible. I referenced this last week when we were talking about Joshua's story, but I want to read to you a couple of verses here. This is a part of the conversation between the two spies that came from Israel into Jericho. You remember the story of Rahab. She hid them from the men of the city. And after the men had gone out, she's having a conversation with these two spies. And notice what it says in verse number 9 of Joshua chapter 2. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt." Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. These are the words of Rahab, okay? Rahab was a heathen and a harlot up to this point. And as she's talking to these two spies, she makes the statement, We know that God has given you this land. Our hearts have melted. There's no more courage in us to even withstand you anymore. And she identifies the specific time when this change occurred, when the inhabitants of the land of Canaan became deathly afraid of the Israelites. It was 40 years prior. When they heard how that God had split the Red Sea and they had walked across on dry ground, and Pharaoh and his army had been drowned. When they heard that shortly after that, they destroyed King Sihon and King Og and their armies. They heard these things and they said, we're doomed, we're done. What can we do against a people who serve a God who is so powerful? A God who can split the Red Sea, who can destroy those kings like they utterly destroyed them, is a God that we cannot stand against. Before the Israelites ever stepped foot in the land of Canaan, God had already prepared the way for them. He had promised it to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31. We find confirmation of it in Joshua chapter number 2. In other places in Scripture, we read some of the other things that God did in order to prepare the way for them. One of my favorite things is God sent hornets into the land of Canaan. Yeah, hornets. The big things with wings and stings. God infested the land of Canaan with hornets to drive out inhabitants from certain areas. That's got to be pretty bad. Well, you've got to understand, this was before the days of modern pesticides. They couldn't go down to the hardware store and buy a can of bee spray. You know, that's what we do. If we get a yellow jacket's nest or a hornet's nest, we'll just go get a can of bee spray and wait till after dark, okay? And then we'll go out there and we'll spray it and we'll, we'll take care of those things. 
They didn't have that back then. And when they had an infestation like this, the only thing they could do was move away somewhere else. God did these kinds of things long before the Israelites ever crossed Jordan and came into the land of Canaan. Why? Because God said, I'm going to prepare your way for you. I'm going before you. I'm getting things ready so that when you get there, it's already ready for you. Psalm 23 and verse number 5. The psalmist said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God prepares our way. Wherever you are going, and whenever you're going to get there, please know that God is already there getting things ready. God's already there. It's not a matter of, you know, you're almost there and God says, Oh man, I, I better hurry up and get things ready for them. God's already working. Whatever God's doing in your life right now is part of the preparation for what is coming down the road. God's already working. He knows the beginning from the end. He's planned the beginning from the end. He's got it all worked out. Here on earth, God has it all planned out and all prepared for you. So that all you have to do is follow God's word and follow God's will. And that promise of preparation is yours to claim. But you know, I think the best preparation that God has made for us is not preparation here on earth. But John 14 and verse number 6, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. It's wonderful to know that here on earth, God is preparing our way, so that whatever is around the next turn, God's already there taking care of it. But what's even better to know and to have all assurance in our hearts is that when this life is over, God has prepared a place for us in heaven. And that preparation has already been made. It happened nearly 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. And when Jesus fulfilled the plan of salvation, the way was prepared. Truly, He was the Lamb slain before the foundations of the world. In the mind of God, the preparation was made in eternity past. But in the timeline of history, that preparation was completed when Jesus rose from the grave to live forevermore. And now that means there's nothing more for you to do except, ex except to accept the free gift of salvation. In my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus said. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, I don't know if we think about, well, what's my mansion going to look like? I'm convinced when we get to heaven, we're not going to care. We're not going to be counting bedrooms. We're not going to be counting bathrooms. We're not going to be measuring square footage. It's heaven. That's what makes it wonderful. And you know what's really wonderful? Jesus is the one who's done the preparation. So I guarantee you it's not going to be a fixer-upper. Uh, our family, I think it's safe to say we have a pattern now of buying fixer-uppers. And not just houses. It seems like we have a dog that's a fixer-upper now. <laughs> And, you know, I like working with my hands, but there's sometimes it's just, I, 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 I think to myself, man, wouldn't it be nice just to, like, walk into a house and not have to do anything to it, ever? I mean, even if you buy a brand new house, custom built by Daniel Lucius, if you live in it long enough, you're going to have to do something to it, right? When you get to heaven, you're not going to walk in the mansion and be like, man, this is really nice, but we got to do some work here. No, it's prepared. It's all done. Just like the plan of salvation is all done. A lot of people think that Jesus, you know, started the preparation. On the cross, He died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and He got the ball rolling, and now all we have to do is, is take over from there. And so if we'll, you know, trust Jesus and keep up a life of good works, then we can get to heaven. That is the most diabolical lie that has ever been told. Because it sends people to hell every single day. Jesus is not only the author of our faith, He is the 
finisher of our faith. When he was on the cross, did he not cry, it is finished? Not it started, it's finished, it's done, completed. And the word Jesus used was a word that was actually used in accounting in, in Bible times, where if, if you had a debt and you were making payments on it, when, the, when it was paid off, they would mark your bill paid in full. Tetelestai is the Greek word. Paid in full. You don't owe anything else. The debt is gone. That's the word that Jesus cried on the cross. Paid in full. It's finished. There's nothing left that we can or could pay. Jesus has done it all. So when, when Moses told Joshua, the Lord will go before you, he was promising to prepare the way for Joshua and the children of Israel. And that's why we can have guaranteed success. Because when we follow God's word and God's way, obey His will, we have the promise of His preparations. But then, secondly, we have the promise of His presence. Look at Deuteronomy 31 and verse number 8 again. Deuteronomy 31 and verse number 8. He it is that doth go before thee, and he will be with thee. That's the promise of the presence of God. I think one of the dearest promises in all of Scripture is this particular promise. It's reiterated over and over again, from beginning to end, that God's presence is with us. And those of us who know Christ as our Savior, that is a particular presence, not just a, a general sense, well, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. So, you know, He's, he's with us because He's everywhere. No, God is with you personally. It may sound a little bit irreverent to think of it this way, but it's like having a personal assistant. The idea is that God is always right there to help you. Psalm 46 and verse number 1, He is a very present help in trouble. This is the kind of presence that we're talking about. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 9, God again would say to Joshua, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thy, thou dismayed. Why? For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And when you know that God is with you, then you can also know that you will succeed in whatever God wants you to do. Because He's there helping you. Or it might be more accurate to say He's there doing it through you. And for you. Doing God's will for our life and succeeding in life is not a result of our grit and determination. It's not a result of our ability to develop good habits. Now, I, I think there are I think there is a lot to be said about having good discipline in life. I think that's a godly characteristic. But it's not our, our habits and our disciplines that will guarantee success. Having God with us guarantees our success. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us to take heed and beware of covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake. God is with you. And the Lord reminds Joshua here of this wonderful truth at the very beginning of his, uh, his rule, his leadership over the Israelites, that it wasn't going to be his presence that guaranteed success. It would be God's presence. And I love how this is so wonderfully illustrated in their very first battle. Can anybody tell me what city did the very first battle for the land of Canaan take place at? Jericho. Very good. You know the song? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Okay, some of you do. Some of you aren't awake yet, so. The, 
presence, and, and we'll talk in a minute about the power of God too, but the presence of God was so amazingly illustrated at the Battle of Jericho. Because at the Battle of Jericho, God comes to Joshua before they go into the Promised Land. He said, all right, Joshua, here's the plan. Here's how we're going to take the city of Jericho. And I just imagine Joshua, he's, he's ready, he's listening, he's hanging on every single word. All right, Lord, how are we going to do it? How do we need to divide our army up? What kind of divisions do we need? How many archers do we need? You know, how many shields, how many swords? You know, how, you know, you know how many provisions? Are we going to lay siege to it? Are we all going to attack it? Are we going to burn them out? What are we going to do? And he's listening, and God says, this is what I want you to do, Joshua. I want you to get everybody together, and I want you to go, and I want you to walk around the city one time. Okay, and then what? Throw rocks? Uh, what, what, what's next? Nope, go back to camp. That's it. And then the next day, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, Joshua's like, okay, okay. First day was just warm up, right? Okay, second day, what are we going to do? Joshua, get everybody together. I want you to go out there to Jericho, and I want you to walk around the city one time. Yeah, that's it. Do this for six days. And then on the seventh day, all right, here we go, seventh day, we're going to shake things up here. Been walking around, got our muscles, you know, back in shape, we're ready to fight. God says, I want you to go out and I want you to walk around the city, how many times? Seven, Seven times. And then what, attack? No, make a lot of noise. I am not a military scholar. That is the most unconventional battle plan in the history of the universe. God says, here's what's going to happen. When you do it this way, I'm going to step in and I'm going to do something. I'm going to knock down the walls of Jericho. And then you're going to walk right into the city and you're going to spoil it. And you know what Joshua did? He followed God's will. He followed God's word. They walked around that city one time a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day, and then they made a whole lot of racket. And sure enough, the walls fell down. And they walked right in the city and spoiled it. There's a site over there that we can't say with absolute certainty that this is Jericho, but man, it fits everything that the Bible describes. And in this particular site in the land of Israel, right where Jericho should have been, they have uncovered an ancient city that at one time had some very impressive walls. It was actually multi-level walls. And what they found is that at some point, this city was destroyed. And the upper level of walls fell down, but they didn't fall in. You know, when you attack a, a, a walled city and you're battering it from the outside, the walls would fall in. But they didn't fall in. At this particular site, the walls fell outward. And as the walls fell outward, they cascaded down the hill and they filled in the multiple levels, the terraces they had, and it created a perfect ramp all the way around this city where you could literally just walk in. Except for one little place on the backside of this city next to the mountain, there was this one section of wall that for some reason didn't fall. It sounds a lot like Jericho. Remember Rahab's house on the wall? And her family was spared? The point is that because God was with them, that was enough. That was enough. They didn't need battering rams. They didn't need AK-47s. They didn't need tanks. They had God. Paul said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of Christ. What does that mean? It means if you have Jesus, you have enough. Yeah, but I need this, this. No, do you have Jesus? Does the Lord Jesus Christ dwell in your heart by faith? If so, you have enough. You have enough. His presence is enough. And because God is with you, when you follow His will and obey His word, you are guaranteed success. 
But then there's a third promise as we close back in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse number 8. God says, He and the Lord, He it is that doth go before thee, and He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. He will not fail. I believe this is the promise of the power of God. The power of God. You know, there's a lot of things that we wish we could do, and in our minds we know we should do it, but we just, we fail. We come short. We find that our limited human resources aren't enough. Physically, we don't have enough strength. Mentally, we don't have enough energy. Spiritually, we have so much of the carnal flesh that's stopping us from doing what we wish we could do and we know we should do. We are so limited, but not God. God's power is limitless. The, the theological term, omnipotent. Omni, meaning all. Potent, meaning power. Powerful. God is all powerful. The Lord God omnipotent. We call him the Almighty God. Why do we use that expression, Almighty? We don't, we shouldn't use that word for anything else. Because when we say Almighty, we mean that God has all power. There is nothing that God has promised that He cannot do. God does not overcommit Himself. You know, sometimes we make promises and commitments to people, and we have every good intention of following through, but we, we don't. Maybe something else happens, and we are prevented from doing it. Maybe we didn't understand all that was involved, and we overcommitted ourselves, and we couldn't do it. God never does that. He has all power, and therefore, Moses could say to Joshua, you will succeed, not because you can't fail, you will succeed because God can't fail. So many people are depending on themselves for success. And if you are depending on you for success in life, you are depending on a flawed, finite person. You can fail. In fact, if I were to give you 30 seconds to list three failures, it would probably take you about 10 seconds. You know that you're limited. You know that you fail. I fail all the time. Our success is not guaranteed because we can't fail. Our success is guaranteed because God cannot fail. He will not fail thee. He will not forsake thee. God, again, His presence is promised, but it's a permanent presence. God is not going to be like, oh, okay, here we are, let's do this. Oh, wait, that's, that's a lot harder than I thought. See you, you're on your own. God doesn't do that. He will never fail. He will never forsake. When we talk about the power of God, it involves both the authority of God and the ability of God. God has all authority because He's the creator of the universe. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore... And teach all nations. All authority. God rules over the universe. He has the ultimate say in everything. But not only does He have the authority, He also has the ability. I love this verse from Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Think about that question. God says to you today, is there anything too hard for Him? What's the biggest problem you have in your life right now? I want you to take a minute. Do, do this mental exercise with me. What is one thing that in your opinion is an obstacle to success for you? In anything. Whatever goal it is you're trying to achieve. In, in your family, in your health, in your finances, in your workplace... Whatever it is. What's a goal you want to achieve? And what is the biggest obstacle then to that goal? Think about that for a second. The biggest obstacle. Is it a relationship gone bad? 
Is it a medical diagnosis? Is it a uh, financial hardship? Is it a, what is it? Think about it. What's that obstacle? You got that in your mind? Now answer this question. Is it too hard for God? Is it too hard for God? I don't even know what the obstacle is in your mind that you're thinking of right now, but I already know the answer. The answer is no. It's not too hard for God. Whatever the obstacle is, God can overcome it. The ten spies said, yeah, but their cities are, are big and walled. They're fortresses. God said, I can knock that over like that with a bunch of screaming Israelites. He said, but yeah, they're, they're people of war and, and they're huge. And God says, I already took care of that back at the Red Sea. As soon as that, you know, hashtag cross the Red Sea hit Twitter in Canaan land, they were all like, we're done. God had already took care of that. Is there anything too hard? No. The power of God. God has the ability. And the reason that Joshua was guaranteed success is because he had the preparations of God. God went before him. He had the presence of God. God was with him. And he had the power of God. His authority and His ability, all working on Joshua's behalf. Now Joshua and the Israelites made some mistakes when they went into the con uh, to conquer the, con the I'll get it out here conquer the promised land. They made some mistakes. They didn't do everything right. Because of that, generations had to deal with the repercussions of of people left in the land who should have been expelled. But by and large, they were successful. They conquered the land. They took possession of it. And they settled it. So that even still today, the nation of Israel is right there. But it wasn't because Joshua was a brilliant political leader. It's not because he had a genius mind for military strategy. It's because he followed God's word and God's will. And that guarantees success. So whatever it is that God wants you to do with your life, you are guaranteed success if you obey his word and follow his will. Because you have the preparations of God, the presence of God, and the power of God all working on your behalf. And I want you to notice at the end of verse number 8, there is something missing from our Bibles at the end of verse number 8. My, my Bible, after the word dismayed, there's a period. If this had been one of these self-help gurus, there would be an asterisk there. And you would look down at the bottom of your page and it would say, or your money back. It doesn't say that, does it? Because there is no stipulation. Obey God's word, follow God's will. And His preparations, His presence, and His power will work in your behalf to guarantee your success. Heavenly Father, as we close in prayer, I want to thank you for how you work in our lives to achieve your will through us. It's only ours to yield and obey. And if we do, you accomplish through us so much more than we could ever do on our own. Thank you, Lord, that our success is guaranteed because you cannot fail. Because you always keep your word. And you're always with us to help us. Lord, Work in our hearts when we're tempted to want to be independent, to go our own way and do our own thing. And your grace and your mercy remind us of how finite, how limited we are in knowledge and in power. And may we just, Lord, then rest upon your 
guidance and your care and your strength to enable us to succeed for your honor and glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name.